<laughs> my name is Kim Naraki. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast. I'm the Assistant Director for Events and Programs at WCET, and I'm going to quickly go through some housekeeping items so we can get started. We'll put a link to the slides in chat so that you can download those if you like. And as we go through the webinar today, please use the Q&A section for your questions. You can find that button at the bottom of your screen. Um, well, I'm sure this will be a dynamic conversation, so we'd like to reserve the chat for, for your comments and your discussion and use the Q&A for your questions. We are recording and we'll share that with you by next week. Today's webcast is can micro-credentials re-engage 40.4 million learners? And we are hosting it today with support from Straighter Line. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, Megan Raymond, our Senior Director of Membership and Programs. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Hi, everybody. It's great to see so many familiar names and new friends in the participant list. We'd like to know how things are going in your neck of the woods. Uh, it's very overcast and cloudy here in Colorado, and we're not used to that. So everyone had to adjust their lighting so that it actually looked like we weren't in dark offices. I'm so excited about this topic, and we pulled together some wonderful panelists. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. We'll start with Janelle. Thanks, Megan. Good morning, everyone. My name is Janelle Elias. I work at Rio Salado College in Tempe, Arizona. I'm the Vice President of Strategy, Advancement, and Academic Affairs. Happy to be here today. Thank you, Janelle. And Noah? Hey, everybody. Noah Geisel, Micro-Credential Program Manager at University of Colorado Boulder. Great. And Amy? Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. We're so glad you're here. Amy Smith, Chief Learning Officer of Strider Line, and super excited for a good conversation today. Thanks, Megan. Excellent. And I think we're going to move on to a poll. Kim, do you have that poll ready? We'd love to know where you're at with your micro-credential journey. So we'll pop that poll up and go ahead and just take a moment to respond. We do this poll periodically, and it's interesting to see how trends some somewhat change, but the more things change, sometimes they stay the same too. Interesting. I think this kind of rings true with what we've been seeing over the past few years. So many are in the early discussions at their institutions, sort of wondering where to start. Some of you have started and you're beginning the implementation stage. Uh, and several of you have a, a solid initiative that's a few years old to very mature. So we'd love to hear your experiences in the chat. But we're going to go ahead and move to the conversation. So Kim, if you want to advance, um, We'll go ahead and have Amy lead us through some of the report findings, and then we'll be sharing that report as well. Thank you so much, Megan. So at Strider Line, one of the things we've been working on, and we're always leaning into, is uh, the modern working adult learner. Who are they? What, what do they worry about? What are their motivations for going to school? We see over 45,000 students a year at Strider Line, and of course, we're not a college. You can't get a credential with us, but we absolutely do partner with hundreds of all of you at institutions. So we set out really to study, well, if 40.4 million people have some college and no credential or no degree, who are they? And while we all talk about this in higher education, this is a huge need, area for growth, a large gap, if you will, we often wonder, what are the learners really thinking? So we set out to do some voice of student research. Our first study, we actually really asked people who had disengaged from college, school, why did you disengage? Why did you leave? What might bring you back? Are you ever interested in completing a credential or a degree? And if you are, what would that look like? We learned a ton. That then we continue to ask questions leads to more conversation for us. So this particular study is how can higher education actually get the some college no credential population to return? If you are interested in coming back, what would really make you more interested? And if so, is there anything that we could ultimately do uh, from a programmatic or a school institutional sense to entice you to come back to school. So we asked the question, number two, what role do alternative credentials play in getting that 40.4 million 
um, with some college and no credential back into school? The answer is we can. And they they told us. So let's take a look at what they had to say. Next slide, please. Thanks, Megan. So there's a ton of stuff on this slide, and this is one of the reasons I love it. We really asked our disengaged learners, what are the top reasons? Why did you leave? And you can see Sean and Whitney right there in that very first column, they left for financial reasons. You can see Sandra as a persona, she had family commitments. So somewhere along the way, we often leave for finances. Whitney, 58% of the population in our response responses, 58% of our respondents, sorry, actually basically left for, they disengaged with their program for financial reasons. Here's what I love about the second column. They hit a point in their career where they felt stuck. So financially I'm leaving and I feel, in, from a career perspective, I feel stuck. We then asked in this study, how likely are you to come back? If we could find a degree completion or a pathway back to finishing a credential, how likely would you be to pursue it? Whitney, that middle, that's why you see the green right down that slide, 50% of that population said, I'd be very likely to come back. And then we said, okay, so if you are likely to come back, why? Why would you? And you'll see again, Sean and Whitney say, to improve my salary, 73% of uh, the persona of Whitney said, I would return to higher education for a credential or a degree, honestly, really to improve my salary. So then we thought, okay, we've got a population who we know why you left. We think we can get you back and you want to come back to improve your salary and you feel stuck in your career. Got it. Now, what do I have to do as an institution to actually get you back? That was the key question. And if I gave you credit for prior learning, would you be more likely to return? Would you pick me as a program? 96% of our respondents, and the N was higher than 1,000 in this particular study, said yes. 96% said if you did CPL and some form of PLA, we would be much more likely to return. So then we asked a second question. Okay, if that's enticing, are stackable micro-credentials that continue to stack into larger credentials or into your degree, would that bring you back even more? Yes. 94% of our respondents said yes. So you've got CPL and micro-credentials are added value. This is increased ROI for this adult population. Next slide, Megan. And then the next one. Thank you. So we actually asked, well, of this population, where are you in your career? Like, okay, so you're stuck in your career, you want to improve your salary, and you're interested in going back, and we know now that credit for prior learning and micro-credentials might get you back. Where are you? Well, 50% of our respondents are actually mid-level in their career. This is pretty significant. But a lot of our population, 39% in this particular study, they're earlier in their career. And we'll, we'll play these two out as we continue this conversation. Next slide, Megan, please. So then we actually asked, all right, if you're feeling stuck in your career, please rate how strongly you agree or disagree with the following statement. I've reached a point in my career where I feel like I don't have the opportunity to advance. And when you really look at the strongly agree and disagree, you're looking at 46% of the population who feels stuck. They really do. They just feel like ultimately their, their desire to have a different career trajectory and improve their work prospects is a really large motivating factor in their potential interest for coming back to school. And they told us so, this is their voice. That's really the best part. So they disengaged from higher education. They're feeling stuck in their career. What's gonna bring them back? How likely are they to return? And if they are likely to return, what makes the difference between school A and school B, institution one or institution two? In essence, do alternative credentials and stackability of those into larger credentials or degrees basically earn while they're learning, right? Does that have any impact on their decision? And the resounding answer is yes, it's huge. Next slide, Megan, please. So then we wanted to figure out, okay, if you're interested in pursuing a de completion degree program, how big is that interest? Like, what does that really look like for you? We both ultimately learned that 29% of our respondents are very, very likely to keep going. They want to complete. This is a four or a two-year degree. 
And again, they want stackability along their way. Many of them are stuck in their career. Higher education burned them out once before. So they're often weary of considering higher education as an avenue again. So the question that they even posed for us in the survey is, how can you add value along the way? I get that it's 60 credits. I get that it's 120 credits. What else can I get along the way? That became a really large part of our findings. Next slide, Megan, please. So then we asked, all right, let's go into your motivations. We want to know the why. The why from the student voice. We think, yeah, you left for financial reasons. You would consider coming back. You want to increase your salary and you feel stuck in your career. So what would be the largest motivating factors? What are your goals in coming back? Well, you can see 48% said to improve your salary. I love the second one. 44% said it was a personal goal. I went to school and I started for a personal goal and I want to come back. But look at the career advancement and the career change columns, 32% and 29. Look at the word career, salary, career advancement, career change, 25% strength and job security. So it really is about your career and your job. Next slide, please. So then we said, well, if you're going to select a degree completion program, if you're going to find a place to finish whatever finish means to you as an adult learner, when you're thinking about it, what important factors go into your decision? What variables are you basing this decision on? You're not going to be surprised. Of course, it's cost, right? 68% of our respondents said, well, the cost or the tuition of the degree, of course. But look at 56% who said speed. The speed to which I can actually finish. 33% said number of credits. And then also, I love this middle column. 33% said, does the, does the institution communicate with me quick, quickly, understandably, and on a personable level? And then look at the 31% there in the middle. The ability to earn credentials, such as a badge or a certificate that demonstrates my competencies along the way of the degree would bring me back. So that's student voice. You've got 31% of our respondents saying that it's a real thing. Stackability and micro-credentials really matter. Next slide, please. So what does that ultimately mean for enrollment? Back to our earlier conversation on prior learning interest. When we asked our students, literally three quarters of our respondents, 78% of our respondents basically said, that credit for prior learning would greatly increase their interest in completing their degree. So think about that for a moment. For this, with the some college, no degree, no credential population, you're looking at 40.4 million, right? So 78% equates to 31.5 million working adult learners. That's huge. 31.5 million potential people out there ready to come back with a little bit of incentive. CPL is such an incentive. Next slide, please. So a similar percentage, 76% said a micro-credential would help them come back. That indicating my knowledge or skills along the way, getting credit and being able to prove and demonstrate what I know and can do as I earn my degree um, would greatly increase my likelihood of actually coming back. So let's go back to that 40.4 million and put things in perspective again. When you're looking at stackable micro-credentials and you're looking at that some college, no degree, no credential population, you're looking at 30.7 million people who raise their hand and are 94% more likely to come back to school if we just built stackable micro-credentials into a degree pathway and made it apparent and clear demonstrable, shareable, provable to employers and to the adult working learner, the students themselves. So last slide, key takeaways. Here we go. Ultimately, you 46% of our respondents felt stuck in their careers. That's the big ticket item. They're stuck. 29% were very or extremely likely to pursue a degree completion program. Okay, so what gets that 29% back in the door? Well, the traditional degree isn't going to do it. It's not all that they want. 
this adult working learner, the modern learner is different. They want more. 76% of our respondents said that stackable micro-credentials would greatly increase their interest in finishing their degree, would actually bring them back to school. So with that, I wanted to ground the conversation, thank you, in a little bit of research and a whole lot of data. And of course, we will share this with you uh, in an email as a follow-up, the white paper and the key findings. And my guess is we're probably throwing it into the chat for you right now if we haven't put the slides already. So I'm gonna pass the ball back to Megan to kind of kick us off and open up the conversation. Thank Excellent, you. thank you so much, Amy. So yeah, we'll move on to the moderated conversation piece. And this is where we'll bring in some of the questions that you have throughout the discussion, but do put your questions into the Q&A. And we'd love the chatter that's taking place, but if you put your question in there, I might lose it. So questions in the Q&A, please keep the chatter going in the chat. Uh, Janelle, I'd like to go to you for somebody that is at a large institution that serves um, you know, students all over. How is this information resonating with you? Yeah, I love the persona work because it really relates to who we serve as a community college. So we're a two-year open access community college in, in Tempe, Arizona, one of the 10 Maricopa community colleges. And um, I like how we talked about at a community college, what we see is about 70% of our learners aren't here for a certificate or a degree. They're here for skill building. And so that really resonated as you shared the personas with us. Our average age learner is about 27 to 29 year, years old. And we've worked really hard over several decades to try to create stackable credentials, certificates that second to two year degrees and now four year credentials as well. But what's really working remarkably well is the outreach efforts we're doing in adult education. So non-credit training, either in English language learning, high school equivalency or skill building. And when we serve about five to 6,000 adults annually in the non-credit space in our county, and what we've done is we've created stackable integrated education and training industry credentials for that population to start contextualizing the content and the relevancy of short-term micro-credentials. And it's working really well, um, upskilling them and getting them in, into entry-level employment. The other thing that resonated with this population was that it's not just relevancy of the micro-credential itself, its ability to stack and transfer into other degrees, but the flexibility in which we've had to adjust our delivery models and a lot of interesting experimentation there in the modalities of which we're offering non-credit credentials, micro-credentials, and alternative credentials. So at RIA, we have weekly start dates and we have an asynchronous online model. Those are some of the features that help learners complete, again, high flexibility as free as possible and short stackable micro-credentials that combine to create um, both educational and then career pathways. So it really resonated with me. And what I loved about the research was that it's focused on the voice of the learner. So I haven't seen a lot of micro-credential research from this perspective, and I, I greatly validate it. Thank you. Amy, any thoughts there? Is it funny to say no? I, I was just, there's <laughs> so much there to unpack. So Janelle, thank you. Thank you for a gigantic thought. Uh, I love it. But I also think that it's incredibly important to acknowledge that it, from our perspective, our research shows us that be it open access two year, right? Community college or four year, non-open access. We heard from both, from all sides of the conversation, the student voice was profoundly saying, we need additional value. The degree is valuable, but we need value along the way. So I'll pass it back to you, Megan, to keep us rolling, but I can, I can riff on that one all day. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you. And Noah, I want to go to you because uh, in my book, you're Mr. Micro-Credential. I go to you with a lot of my questions. So I have a really easy one for you. And this is um, sort of off script, but I think on topic. Can you define micro-credentials for us? What is our current working definition? Mm, that, that's a good question. Um, and I think especially because one of my takeaways from Amy sharing and from the report was the importance of communications and clear communications that there is just so much confusion right now in the landscape. And um, some of it is for good reason. And a whole lot of it is because we're just, um, I, I love this term that I re read recently in white paper, we're over-indexing 
on our explanations of these things and and make it more complicated than it needs to be. And so I think that um, to directly answer your question, I, I, there is not a standardized definition of what these things are. It is still very local. And, and you know, I, just in the chat, I see there's you know folks from this different campuses within the same system. And some of them are going to be nodding along thing. Yeah, depending on which zip code you're in, even in the same system that we might not have shared um, sort of frameworks for what this is. I, I can share that where I think the trend is going and just, you know, selfishly at the University of Colorado Boulder, our, our viewpoint is to take micro credentials as a programmatic term. So, so a unit proposes a micro credential, it gets approved, learners apply to or declare for or enroll in a micro credential. And upon successful completion of a micro credential, we issue digital badges. Um, and so that my boss has a great analogy that, you know, as diplomas are to degrees, as artifacts that are describing the accomplishment, badges are to micro credentials. Thank you, Noah. Janelle, do you have anything to add on that? Janelle was on our WCET steering committee work group on micro credentials, and we we really tried to pull together definitions that were used across uh, institutions and organizations and synthesize you know, what, what the easiest definition is. And I think, Noah, you summed that up very well. But Janelle, do you have a working de definition that Rio has stuck with? Yes, and a caution that you could spin here forever. So don't let that work of taxonomy definition building bog your institution down. We did have to do that to contextualize how it makes sense as a distinct unit from certificates of completion or other credentials that we were already offering. And so it's a step worth taking. Um, but in this space where we're several years in, um, it's still okay that people are packaging relevant packages of learning that relate to specific skills or competencies that often lead to employment. And so we do have a definition now that we've adopted across our system. And um, we continue to challenge that as other people bring innovative ideas to the table as well. So to Noah's point, putting some governance in place was helpful and ensuring that there is a mechanism for someone to review all the ideation and make sure that we can um, have integrity in how we're going to infer quality and also award badging in a consistent way. So we're working through that process of that infrastructure building is critical. Excellent. And Amy, I want to go to you. We talked offline a little bit about what uh, prior learning assessment means. And there is a, a lot of evidence in your report that students have so much skills that they're bringing when they return to an institution for a, a certificate. Uh, what, what does this look like at institutions? How are they providing and assessing um, prior learning experience? Good question. So I, oh, I wish I could, we could do a whole nother webinar on that. And with, with so many partners, we see some really great examples and exemplars where CPL and PLA as the engine that drives that uh, works really well, right? So I'm at the community college level for Janelle, I'm going to give community colleges a lot of credit here for whatever reason they have really, I'm going to say mastered the art of building out prior learning assessment and involving faculty as needed, but automating where it absolutely can happen and really work. There are, when we think about PLA, there are four major buckets or categories, right, of how we go about this. Um, and we're seeing it in disciplines where specifically where people are crossing disciplines, but community colleges have built PLA systems and structures where the turnaround time is under 48 hours, which is shocking to even be able to say that, particularly when a faculty assessment is involved. The other area where we're seeing a lot of strength in this is re regional four-year institutions. For whatever reason, I have no why. And again, I unfortunately, I love data and I don't have any. But the anecdotes from our partners, or particularly our regional four-year partners, their PLA systems are strong, improving, increasing, and demand is on the increase as well. So I'm not sure I'm actually on target answering your question, but there are exemplars out there of how do you design it? How do you implement it with low resource, right? Like institutions don't have infinite pots of money to do this work, unfortunately. 
Um, but the demand is increasing. It's very real. It's very out there. Uh, and the white paper will talk a little bit more about PLA. You'll get a lot more student voice around PLA and what they're looking for in what areas, how they're seeking it. And the white paper also actually outlines some discipline specific uh, PLA findings that may be of interest. So I'll pass it back to you, Megan. But so thanks. I could spin on that one too long. Sorry. <laughs> no, that that's excellent. I think this is a topic where, especially as we're dealing with enrollment challenges and some of us may be impacted by some of the challenges with FAFSA, but we know that there are 40.4 million learners out there that are looking for a place to start um, entering into the credential landscape and they want to acquire some learning. And I think that prior learning piece is going to be really important for our institutions to get their arms around so that they can attract these students. They are a marketable population. We just need to be able to find them. So I'm looking through the chatter. This There's great discussion, lots of people wanting to know just where do I get started with this? And um, I know that Noah and Janelle, you you have vastly different experience, but at one point you had to sit down and start to map out what this strategy looked like. So I don't know, Noah, let's hear from you first and then we'll go to Janelle if that works. But what piece of advice, because it is it's an ocean, right? and you have to start somewhere. So what piece of advice do you have for people getting started? Well, at the risk of being a mansplainer, I kind of want to just go where Janelle went with relevance. Um, I think that that's a really good place to go that, you know, as we saw in Amy's slide, 76% say they'll return for micro-credentials. You know, I kind of suspect sort of like if people have seen the, you know, it's not about the nail video, um, that it's not about the micro-credential. As much as I love micro-credentials, you know, and believe it's going to change the world. I, I look at that data and think to myself, that's about relevance. That's about people seeing something that is going to, you know, help equip them with what they need in order to access their successful futures. And so, you know, I, I think with any, whether it's micro credentials or really anything, right, it, it's a lot about change management. And so starting with our why, why are we doing this? For whom are we doing this? How does this connect to our mission? You know, and, and then how are we, that there's some great stuff coming out of Upsia that I've seen. I want to say it was Yaku Ghazi at, um, at Duke University who had, had a great quote about saying, you know, it, it, we need to have people at the cabinet level who are involved in this, that this cannot just be a really enthusiastic librarian leading this for our campus. You know, there needs to be strategic leadership and, and leaders being leaders, you know, championing this on our campus. And I think if we start with our why and we're student-centered, and we have the executive sponsorship and championship that we need in order to resource our efforts, you know, then whatever it needs to look like for your learning community is going to have a lot higher chance of succeeding and, and, you know, making decisions that stay made. Yeah, I second that advice. Um, we made it part of our strategic plan that helped us get that executive sponsorship and investment to do this better. Um, we also partnered with some ecosystem builders that exist in this space, such as the Education Design Lab has been a great partner, and we became part of a community of practice so we could learn from the leaders in this space, like SUNY, University of Wisconsin, and Boulder, Colorado, for example. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel, but I think what we tried very hard to do, and probably because I'm a former instructional designer, is to really think through it backwards, start with the end in mind, what was the goal with our micro-credential strategy? And at our community college, it was to open access to more historically underserved populations and get them family sustaining wages. And we have very high demand industries in our county that are growing at a rapid clip. And we were having a hard time keeping pace with our curricular offerings. And so we brought employers to the table and that was a really profound paradigm shift for us, I felt bringing the faculty, the instructional design team, and the employers to do that analysis of how far can we unbundle meaningful micro-credentials, whether they're credit-bearing or non-credit-bearing, um, that would be meaningful and validated by the employer and open do doors to job opportunities, whether those are internships or being interviewed or being hired by these employers in our community. So luckily we had the conditions for that to occur because of growth in high demand areas like IT and advanced manufacturing. But part of our journey was also strategically 
experimenting with multiple types of micro credentials, like the non credit version that's a 10 day boot camp and the one credit version that's six months long. And we allowed that experimentation to be led by our faculty and using some of our um, systematic curricular and instruction delivery mechanisms so that we could also contextualize it within our institution. How are we gonna have a micro-credential strategy add value and not cannibalize or compete with? And so truly making it an on-ramp to our other catalog of offerings, or in some cases, maybe it is just a short-term solution to bridge a high demand area while we work on the long-term um, credit-bearing credential offering as well. So for us, those strategies really, it was ecosystem building and a lot of change management, but we also embedded it in our strategic plan of not only our institution, but our district as well. Thank you, Janelle. And Amy, Straighter Line has over 200 partners and many of them have started on this journey. So when you meet with your institutional partners and they're very overwhelmed with the process, what is some of the advice that you give them when they start this journey? Yeah, that's a great question. So a couple of, because because we offer credit and non-credit courses and we serve really those gen eds and all that foundational skill set, we're in the middle of this conversation a lot, which is a great place to be. So I'm going to push the envelope, Noah, hopefully you're game for this uh, and everybody out there that we, we see the conversation when with institutions begin in what do we already do well and how do we repackage that? So sort of an unbundling of curriculum and then a rebundle. That makes sense and seems incredibly logical. Where we have found uh, profound success in micro-credentialing, institutions have often looked at exactly, Janelle, I'm going to riff off of what you just said, where in the community is their need? And they look to build new. I know that sounds funny, but it's really need and new. And then thirdly, we find institutions who look to what we haven't done before. Maybe we don't have the in-house expertise, or maybe we aren't the expert in X, Y, or Z. And we may not be certain how to feed a community need or solve a problem, but let's explore. So the most successful programs, and I'm going to go back to Noah and Janelle's ecosystem, right, concept, are ones who are looking outside of what they already do well. So it's not unbundling and repackaging an existing curriculum per se, it's building for the next new need. And I'd be curious, Janelle, Noah, push back on me on that one. Does this resonate, not resonate? Thoughts about what I just said? Well, the strategy works better with my faculty partners because it's not competing against you know a lot of their their offerings, which which do create some challenge if we're trying to offer something that's redundant to a credit bearing offering from our faculty. So we found that approach to be welcomed. It adds it's additive and it increases our catalog of offerings. It further brings the institution into a different type of partnership with industry, which is really, really critical to produce the kind of contextualized and um, validated micro-credentials that I think the students are asking for. How about you, Noah? What do you think on that point? You know, at, at the risk of being just a total pleaser who wants to be all things to all people, you know, I, I would push back a little bit on, on Amy's notion uh, that it's necessarily better to, you know, look outward um, and not only, I think, I think we can also look inward to what we're already doing, whether not just with unbundling, but also I think, one of the things when you talk to your colleagues in career services, you know, I, I'm yet to hear somebody in career services say, yeah, 100% of our students are really good at telling their story of, of their, their learning achievement. And so I, I think that there's just so much opportunity to, you know, identify and surface the, the amazing things that aren't showing up on the transcript, right? That we have the names of some courses, some grades, but we don't have our, our, what our learners know and are able to do. And, you know, that we can equip them with these storytelling devices that help them look in the mirror and see what everybody else sees in them who knows them. And that the gives them the ability to see it and, and find that relevance to go back to Janelle's word, right? And, and, and tell that story to grad school admissions, to scholarship committees, to hiring managers, employers, you know, and I, I also want to validate, I think that looking externally is also you know, a, a really smart move, especially as we think around 
just the needs of the, you know, 60, 80 year learner, you know, journey of, of you know, p- people re-engage, engaging and re-engaging with us for decades as, you know, they need upskilling and reskilling. And, you know, one of the things that, that I've seen just in the Colorado landscape, especially in the community college system is just being really dialed into the workforce needs. So paying attention to, you know, we have a workforce development council that puts out a report every year and the people who pay attention to that have their finger on the pulse of, of things. And, you know, you also just kind of have the, the employment need whispers in your ecosystems. And so that there's somebody in Colorado, he, he just is like, you know, that I'm noticing a lot of cranes and, you know, that means there's apartment buildings going up and that means they're going to need to hire a bunch of community managers and so he very quickly in the community college system was able to spin up a credentialing program in community management that included a paid apprenticeship. And so I, I think that, you know, at the risk of dodging the question, I, I do think it's possible to kind of find a way to yes to, to all of those things being valuable. Can I offer another approach to Amy you probably would love? Um, because the majority of our learners aren't seeking credentials with us, we started doing a research study to track what was their intention for coming to our institution. And we were just monitoring natural patterns of course taking behaviors and also found that the learners were telling us that they were waitlisted in pre-med programs elsewhere around the country and were taking these set of courses that they could do while they were waitlisted as prerequisite to a med program. So we actually just created a credential to make that financial aid eligible and it fit a need that we were observing organically through the students' course taking behaviors and through the research on what their intention was. And so that's an interesting, maybe third alternative was monitoring the student course taking behaviors to create an also a meaningful micro-credential. Brilliant. I'm just gonna, I can't add to that, but brilliant. You're right. Listen to your student and watch your, watch your honestly, watch your student data, watch the behaviors and the patterns. It matters. I'm, I'm you know me, I'm. I'm all about student voice, what they're doing. Thank you for that, Janelle. Good one. Excellent. Well, there's quite a few questions, but I have one more before we jump to the audience Q&A. Um, and I think you have touched on this each individually, but there are misperceptions. The cannibalization piece is a big misperception. The faculty resistance is also a perce- misperception. So Noah, uh, you want to talk about how to address some of those misperceptions. Again, a lot of it boils down to change management, but I think you've probably heard most of those hesitancies. A hundred percent and continue to. Like, I, I don't want to pretend that, that you know, I, I'm at a massive, you know, our one institution. I, I want to pretend that we've gotten the message out effectively to a hundred percent of our stakeholders, you know, in any of those groups that you mentioned. But I, I do think that when, we can sit down with people and listen to them, you know, empathize with them and, and make sure that what, you know, we're saying or what they're saying is what they're hearing or what we're hearing and, and just validating our assumptions. Because a lot of times we we find out that actually maybe some of the hurdles, maybe some of the roadblocks or the resistance is, is rooted in communication, not in ethos, um, right? That, that we're not actually butting heads over a fundamental difference in, where we want to be going as an institution serving our learners you know i I think that going back to that learner centered you know kind of focus when we keep the learner at the center of what we're doing it's a lot easier to be on the same page with people and so i I think that that's a really powerful change management strategy um to think about and and you know i i think that you know just going back to that kind of confusion piece and communication the more that we can be clear with people on what this is why it's valuable that this is not about justifying the TE of a micro-credential program manager on campus, right? This is about serving our learners and and making the compelling case about about why it's going to do that, and, and you know ha- being able to clearly and transparently hold up, you know, the relevance of it. I, I think are the kind of keys to success. I do even worry about the buzzword bingo of all of this. And I love what you said earlier, like the end goal is not the micro-credential itself. So staying focused on serving the learner, serving industry, serving the community, um, and grounding ourselves in those shared goals is helpful. In addition to hearing from industry at the table with our academics, we had student voice at the table, and that is also very grounding to guide this work. 
um, not just for the sake of like the latest higher ed trend, but to truly paint a picture of students we weren't serving well and students that could be additive and that we could use micro-credentials as an outreach and engagement strategy. We also use it as a retention and completion strategy. So helping to contextualize where micro-credential approaches add value to either what we're already doing or what we're not doing well has really worked um, on our campus. We also painted the national picture of what's happening when higher education institutions fail to fill this gap. Other organizations will provide the training needed to upskill and reskill their own workforce. And, and that's a real existential threat, I think, to higher education institutions around the country to evolve in this space in a serious way. So we actually invite some of our loudest critics into the project teams, hear them actively, and continue to maintain an eye on what's happening on the national landscape of this work so that we can continue to maintain relevancy as a higher ed institution that serves its community. Excellent. And Amy, uh, we are narrowing our window of time, but I'd like to hear uh, what you have to say about the, the question about conquering misperceptions. Oh, conquering misperceptions. So it's a it's a great, I, the, I, nothing that Noah and Janelle haven't already said other than it is a lot of communication, but I'm going to go back to the ecosystem and uh, no, I think you're the first one to have mentioned mission. We serve students. And so at the center of everything ultimately is some learner somewhere who at the end of the day is trying to have a different life by going through a learning experience. And however they define that, our research has shown that the student, that student voice is, it is career life centric and you have to get at their why. So Janelle, you had mentioned having students at the table and you had discussed around serving, serving learners, but then we also have to serve their why. And I think that we think about it, we talk about it, but I'm not sure we lean in and listen to it. And I would say that then we're building programs, learning experiences, micro-credentials, offering PLA programs for CPL that actually fit what they want and what they need. So much easier said as I say that than to actually execute and do it. Um, but I love this panel for the conversation because Janelle and Noah are, are in the doing. They're actually making it happen for real people. And they're great exemplars of what this space can look like and how it can really change the workforce and how we think about workforce in the US. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Okay, well, I've scrolled through the questions and everyone I'm like, oh, that's a good one. And we just don't have time for all of them. So audience, please go in and thumbs up the ones you want me to really focus on because they're all fantastic, but I need some help um, sort of skimming off the, the cream on the top. But the one I'm gonna go to, um, there's one about financial aid issues and that's that's a big one. And uh, like New York is sort of getting their arms around this. Um, I don't know other examples where they've been able to apply financial aid for micro-credentials. Noah, Janelle, do you, do you wanna to speak to that at all? That is a big question you know, when you are starting this sort of work. I'll just say we continue to lobby for financial aid for, you know, and short-term help for these types of programs. However, um, there's a lot of other funding out there. And what I'm finding too is a lot of employers are willing to pay for micro-credentialing for incumbent entry-level workforce. So we can reach a lot of those personas by tapping into other funding sources, promise programs, um, philanthropic efforts, just to get this moving in our community that's been a successful um, start for us, provided the gap there in funding. Yeah, but my fun, financial aid is not really my wheelhouse. One of the things I can say is that I, at ACRO, I, I did see that there was a question about registrars that I'll, I'll put a plug in that there is a free ACRO digital communities, uh, pr community practice that, that you do not have to be a member to join. Um, I, I think it's at the bottom of the ACRO website. There's a digital credentials community link and, and there's a lot of good resources there. But at the ACRO conference, one of the panelists uh, really respected shared that they think within five years that a lot of this stuff will be eligible for federal financial aid was their big prediction at the end of their panel. Also shared since Janelle brought up employers being willing to pay for it, that there's something that another group that kind of a neat community that's free to join is the T3 Innovation Network from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. 
Um, and also put a plug in that they're going to be hosting their mid-year meeting in conjunction with a conference we host in August at the University of Colorado Boulder called the Bad Summit um, at CU Boulder, thebadsummit.com. Um, early registration ends in a week, so get in, save money. But um, the T3 Innovation Network is sharing that they're lobbying right now for a sort of a employee benefit similar to a 401k, that there's a learning and training benefit of uh, something like $1,500 a year is what they're lobbying for. And so just imagine if millions of American workers are, are you know, as an employee benefit receiving, you know, $1,500 a year towards their continually, you know, learning and training, you know, that's a lot of um, revenue there that's going to be, you know, earned by some learning providers and maybe it's you. Excellent. All right. The next question, how important is aligning micro credentials to skills for making them attractive to SC and D learners? And what's the best path for skills alignment? I'm looking to see if anybody really. What's the acronym, Megan? I, I don't know that one. SCND. Can non somebody clarify what that means? Some credential, no degree. Some credential, no degree. Some college, no degree. SCND, some college, no degree population. So can I'll just I just want to state that I love that acronym because I I, I am on a warpath against non traditional. I think that that is a, a factually incorrect statement and a misnomer that also others who is actually factually the majority of our post secondary um um population. So th I, I just want to share some gratitude for that acronym. Megan, can you ask that question one more time? How important is aligning micro-credentials to skills for making them attractive to the some college no degree learners? What's the best path for skills alignment? I'll just share, if I could, our journey, Amy, because we leaned into tools like the credentialing platform itself and how they connect to tools like Lightcast. We also have a tool in our state called Pipeline AZ that will um, flag skills to jobs, right? And so that making that connection really explicit really makes that an attractive offering to someone who's re-careering, upskilling, or looking for that next promotion. So there are digital tools that can help make the connection from the skills to the employment opportunities. What we have to do is the hard work of mapping the skills within our curriculum offerings. And um, I found it to be well worth it and hardly anyone's resisting that. We're really excited to surface these skills, to make them more visible and portable and validate them. And it also is a journey of building competence and confidence for our learners. So that's been our approach to that. What were you going to say, Amy? I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you didn't interrupt me at all. I, I'm confirming. Our research actually shows it's really, it's not a skill list link. It's this, this uh, pocket of learning, whatever that series or sequence or set of um, learning experiences, I'm going to use the word term courses is to the job. So we found the bridge to employability as more the conversational space than, hey, you're going to have these 14 discrete skills when you're done. Although we needed to do that curricular mapping, of course, right? And then that helps us at Straighter Line map into degree pathways and other credentials with you all, with our partners, 100%. But the conversation for the potential learner is really about the job and what the job is going to be and why that credential, whatever that is, will lead to the employability. That was really the link. And I think our research showed that it's about the career trajectory and career mobility. And I love the term career mobility that came from the voice of our students. That it, So I'm just parroting what you say, but the link, I think is the job. Good point. Thanks for letting me add that on. And and because you know mentioned the the like uh, lightcast data or, or fathom data, you know that there's there's just so much opportunity for us is on the you know to transition from the programmatic side to the credential side of you know the digital badge piece and or or you know LER CLR. There's just so much opportunity if we want to take advantage of it to contextualize and add transparency to again what the credentials are credentialing to to highlight the relevance in really sophisticated ways that are you know, both meaningful to the human eye, but also machine actionable. And so when we take advantage of skills tagging, it allows us to sort of bridge the, you know, have apples to apples and not just have technology that's interoperable, but language that's interoperable from 
you know, the learner language to the faculty language, to the institutional language, to the language of our employers. And, you know, so much that gets lost in translation, but, you know, we have the opportunity in the metadata to, you know, operationalize, you know, stuff that where that stuff doesn't get lost in translation. So really to, looking into that, and if, if you don't have that, you know, internally yet, it, find a consultant who can help you with that or, or go to conferences where you can learn about that or ask your customer success reps at your vendors to help you with that. Because it's, I, I think it's going to start at, when we move from, some people doing this to everybody doing this. I think that that's going to be one of the things that starts to help certain campuses stand out and have a competitive advantage is you know, their credentials are going to be doing this narrative storytelling in machine actual ways that give their credential earners a competitive advantage over the earners from every other institution. Fantastic. All right. I I think we have time for one more question. And Amy, this really is geared at you and the report and more about the personas. And the report really does go into further detail about each of the persona types. Mm -hmm. um, but if you could talk about the um, whether, le whether level of career or industry of their employments were part of considering factor when building the personas. Um, the question really is getting at, you know, there's a big difference between Sean and Whitney, and I don't think we have time to pull the slides back up, but we'll re-put the link to the slides and the report in the chat. Um, but talk about, you know, maybe they're just on different career trajectories. And one of the things I noticed in the report is a lot of the respondents did not indicate what type of industry they were in. So I'm wondering if there was a correlation there too. There is. So the the actual white paper report not only breaks down the personas, but it breaks down the personas by age, demographic, industry, industry entrance, and career pathway, where they are. Are they an entry level first year right out of high school? Are they kind of mid-career? And it also rolls in um, work experience around that career and family situation. So the demographic the, the persona picture is really robust. We did a lot of multivariate work to get that sorted out and you'll see that. And we do have interest in specific industries and then also the experience of the some college, no degree or no credential population by industry, business, computer science, healthcare, hospitality, different industries. Um, so it's, it's in there and it'll definitely lay it out and make it a richer picture. So no, this slide is like the 50,000 foot overview of a lot more detail. And if anybody ever wants to geek out on this, I'm your person. You know, I think this research is fun and sexy. So geek out all day, track me down for a cup of coffee. I'd love to chat more about it. So thanks, Megan. Yeah. Thank you. Sexy research. I think that's kind of a good place to maybe wrap up. Let's go around and um, Amy, Noah, Janelle, you all have so much experience to share and we really value your perspective. So those in the audience are really looking for some tangible action they can take. So if we could go around and just give one piece of advice on how to get started with this work. Amy, let's start with you. You're off mic, off mute, on mic. Uh, the, the piece of advice I would give um, would be honestly, to just get started. In higher education, we often want to plan and thank Janelle. I'm going to parallel your conversation around. Don't get bogged down in terminology, right? Too much definition time. Sometimes you just have to get started and it's okay to start small because small can help shift your culture. So we see a lot of success in just getting started. It sounds funny to say in higher ed, but we've seen it work. I'll pass the ball to Janelle. I would echo that. We use design thinking practice, which is a little uncomfortable, um, but we get better at it the more we prototype and iterate. And then I would offer to find a gap in your, uh, in your, in those you serve, your customer base, your community, your employer. Find a gap and work to create a micro credential to bridge that gap. And that's a great place to start. Noah. And selfishly, I, I just want to put another plug for thebadsummit.com. We, we think it's a really great community to learn and share about this stuff and and supercharge uh, how fast you and your team are moving. But uh, in a more sincere way, I, I would piggyback on the don't get ready, get started sort of mantra. And 
you know, to know that you're not alone. So start small, you know, put the A in smart goal and find something achievable to go after. And, you know, we know that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Look at what other people have done and, and find something that feels achievable and, and, you know, go in and pull up your sleeves and, and get dirty and skin up your knees and elbows and, and get started. And you'll realize that no matter how far behind you think you are, you're, you're really not that you know, far from being, you know, neck and neck with the leaders of the pack. Thank you. And that speaks to the survey results that we saw at the beginning when we did the poll. Most of you are just getting started on this journey, and it's been the same when we've done this poll year to year to year. So you are in the right place. You're where your institution needs you to be. And do you remember, I like Janelle's comment about iterating. You don't have to have this all mapped out. There will be detours and bumps along the way, but that's why these communities are so important. So lots of people doing good work. Um, we'll try and pull out some of those resources that were shared in the chat excellent chatter taking place. So thank you for contributing. And I'm going to pass it back to Kim, but thank you so much, Janelle, Noah, Amy. So lucky to call you as friends and colleagues. And thank you so much for your contributions today. Kim. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for an insightful and engaging conversation. As Megan said, we will be uh, pulling out the resources that were shared in chat. Thanks everyone for your contributions there. Um, we'll also be sharing the recording with everyone who registered in a follow-up email, and you can also find it on our website. Thank you again to Straighter Line and Amy for partnering with us on this webcast. Um, visit their website to learn how you can help students fill the gaps in their prerequisite and general education coursework. You can learn more about WCET, our work, and our upcoming events on our website. Um, I do want to plug just a couple of events really quickly. Um, if anyone on your team or you are seeking more information about the changing distance education regulations, be sure to check out our special event that we're hosting this summer in St. Louis. Um, our annual meeting is coming up in Long Beach, California. It will be hosted October 8th through the 10th, and we'll be announcing registration and the draft program later this week. So be sure to check for that on our website. Last but not least, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors and our supporting members who make much of our work at WCET possible. Thank you so much for attending and have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.